I can't do it in this particular forum, but I'd like you all to think about uh, what on whose land you are uh, meeting and be able to at least privately acknowledge uh, their presence. So our webinar um, today will have uh, the chair of our Nature Conservation Committee, Professor Phil Weinstein, will introduce our 2020 grant recipients, uh, some of whom will give you a brief presentation of what their research projects are all about. And then I'll come back on the screen and give you an update on everything that we've been up to uh, while we've been you know, socially isolated. And then Hugo will also uh, add to that for the things that um, I've forgotten or and alternatively how they relate to the strategic plan. Feel free to send in your questions to um, through the Q&A function uh, during the webinar and Greta will relay these to the relevant presenter so that we can get your questions answered. If you have any technical issues, please um, go to the uh, um, the chat function and the panellists will assist you. We'll be recording the webinar um, so that people can view it. Um, in the past, uh, in other organisations I've worked with, we've recorded a lot of things and found that over time, people find them most useful to go back to. So it's something the Foundation will continue to do so that we have film on our website, which is something that's, we've got a new website coming um, in January. So we will have a lot of that film um, able to be seen from there. So we're record as I said, we're recording the, um, webinar um, and for now I'd like to introduce Phil Weinstein, the Chair of our uh, Nature Conservation Committee to present the grant um, awards to our lucky students. Thanks Jan and hi everyone. So uh, Nature Foundation every year does a number of uh, research grants, mainly for students, but uh, also to a broader audience, as I'm sure many of you are aware. So thanks very much to everyone for coming to support that activity as we present uh, the students uh, who have been awarded these grants and a uh, slightly uh, awkward venue, as uh, Jan has outlined already. Uh, but whatever, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, honour and congratulate the grant recipients. So well done to the students and thank you all for coming to help celebrate the, uh, the event. So the Nature Foundation grant round uh, is basically made up of dollars that have been acquired from donations. So uh, yeah, immediately a big thanks to the membership and donors uh, for that without which we couldn't do these awards. And they're really important because they support the research activities of the foundation. And many of those activities are directly uh, related to answering questions that the foundation needs answered to address the management of biodiversity conservation on our reserves. There are some additional grants um, uh, from various sources, for example, seal money, we'll come to that in a minute. But we really would like to acknowledge uh, the, the donors, and that's mainly yourselves, uh, for making that possible and the, the support that that provides for the students, the support that that provides for the students to uh, build their careers and hopefully uh, go ahead and be stewards of our biodiversity for uh, you know the next generation. So the other people I want to thank are the people who serve on the Nature Conservation Committee because they're the ones that uh, vet and uh, allocate the grant applications. And of course, we've got uh, myself chairing that group uh, and uh, the uh, uh, team from the Nature Foundation itself. So there's uh, Amy Ide and Jan Ferguson, the president, who's just spoken to you and uh, you guys, who's the CEO. So I think you know most of us. The people you might not know who we're very grateful to because they're not they're not part of the foundation they're members of the foundation but they basically donate their time and that's um, uh, Andy Johnson, Chris Daniels, uh, Drew Dawson, Jeremy Austin, Merv Lewis, Millie Nichols and Sharon Starrick and I've missed Alex Nan Kibble who's the chief ecologist of Nature Foundation of course um, and all of those people sit on the Nature Conservation Committee so thanks to them. The Nature Foundation has handed out about 2 million grants uh, uh, in the last five years or so, and uh, 400, of, uh, 400 lucky recipients uh, have received those. 
If this year there's about $64,000 allocated um, and uh, 13 recipients uh, for those, uh, four of which will be presenting to you tonight. And I'm sure they're waiting for me to get off and get on with it. So um, before I do introduce the people who have won the awards, uh, one last point is that in the um, chat box, there is the opportunity to ask questions and that's being monitored. So please, if you have questions for any of the presenters or award, award awardees, uh, is the gin you go is feeding us, sorry. Um, I think just put those in the chat room and they'll be addressed by the relevant people at the end of the session. So not during the presentations, obviously, but yeah, at the end. Okay, so the, we've got various categories of grants and the first ones we're going to run through are the Grand Start uh, Awards, which are $3,000 for one year and they're for PhD students or master's students. And as I was saying, they're uh, predominantly projects that align with Nature Foundation's research priorities, but there's some, some other grants as well. And so running through those, uh, Carl Brewer is the first recipient and his project was the native fauna population protecting implants. So thanks uh, uh, Carl for your application and uh, well done for being a winner of a Grand Star grant. And the next one is uh, Jenna Draper, uh, who's looking at the adaptation significance of arid zone dioecious plant pollination. And some of those plants grow on our properties and will uh, hopefully help inform our management thereof. So well done, Jenna. Diego Guevara uh, also received one of the Grand Start grants and he's looking at the effects of microbial communities on topsoil removal or grassland restoration techniques and there he is sitting in the field doing his thing and the next recipient is Alexandria Thompson who's trying to understand the effects of a season of burn on orchids and their mycorrhizae to inform fire management of endangered orchids and there she is doing her thing Clearly not an orchid, but never mind. Uh, Baptiste Wijas is looking at kangaroo overgrazing impacts on termites, an essential food source for small mammals and lizards in arid Australia. And uh, there's a, what looks like an exclosure. Uh, so great project there, and well done, Baptiste, for being another grand grant recipient. Um, that's so. Those those six. Now, I think there's one other coming up later, but they're obviously not here to present. So we just congratulate those and um, money well spent. I think all fantastic projects and good luck to the research projects that those students are doing. So well done. This next one is a little bit special because it's supported by the Australian Sea Lion Fund. Uh, and that's largely made up of donations that are collected on Kangaroo Island in Seal Bay. Uh, people have come visiting there and see the need for the extra funding. So that's sort of a little bit of a special grant. Obviously, there are no sea lions. For those of you who know our properties, no sea lions at Wichelinga, um, no sea lions at Hiltaba. Uh, but nevertheless, we have this really good arrangement with the Sea Lion Fund, and they've funded Tonya Rosewares project forecasting future spatial use of Seal Bay Conservation Park by the endangered Australian sea lion. And there she is with her critters. So congratulations to all of those uh, awardees. That's great. And which brings us very rapidly to our next group of uh, winners. And this is the Grand Start uh, Grants for Honours. So their grants up to $2,000. Not surprisingly, most of the applicants requested $1,999. Uh, but they're for honor students. And we've got a couple of winners uh, there. Uh, Daphne McLeod is the first one, who's looking at the association between airborne microbial diversity and vegetation diversity surrounding urban sports fields in metropolitan Adelaide. And uh, that's clearly not her there. Daphne, really, you could have got us a better picture. Okay. Uh, the next winner, uh, Kendall Whit Whitaker, 
does variation in immune genes influence mate choice in pygmy blue tongue lizards? So as many of you know, we've got a property, uh, Taliqua, with uh, pygmy blue tongue lizard endangered species uh, on our uh, land. And that's very uh, nice to see uh, research projects that is directed at helping us to manage those pygmy blue tongue populations. So when, well done, Kendall. So congratulations to those honours uh, project winners as well, obviously even earlier career uh, researchers and keen to get a really good experience of their research start to life. And thanks very much again to the donors for making those uh, leg ups possible for them. Then we've, we've got a more open category that's not specifically directed at students, although students can apply, but it's research project grants. And uh, there's a couple of uh, sort of subsets of that. One subset is the, again, funded by the Seal Bay Australian Sea Lion uh, Fund collections. Uh, so it's directed at sea lions specifically using that funding. And it was awarded this year to Professor Simon Goldsworthy from Saudi and also an adjunct at the University of Adelaide. And he's using innovative GPS and camera loggers to understand and map critical foraging habitat for Australian sea lions. So uh, if you uh, bear with me, we'll then go on to another project in that uh, project grant round, uh, which is awarded to uh, Nick Whiterod and Sylvia Zukowski. And they're uh, going to actually present to you. So they're the first of our four presentations tonight. And they're going to talk about fish community surveys using environmental DNA sampling uh, to improve our understanding of native freshwater fish in the Wachalunga Nature Reserve, which is, is another nature reserve uh, property. So Nick and Sylvia, uh, are you ready to uh, give us your spiel? Yes, we are. Thank you very much for the grant um, funding. It's, it's most well received and um, yeah, we're looking to put, put it to good use. Um, we're getting used to Zoom meetings. You don't have to leave your house to um, present and you don't have to leave your house to go in the field by the looks of it. <laughs> We've got a net in the background you can see there. But um, our project is focusing on obviously the Wachalanga Nature Reserve, um, and for those of you listening who aren't aware, um, the lower reaches of the Murray-Darling Basin where the Wachalunga occurs are really important um, for freshwater fish. Um, half of the basin species do occur across the lower lakes, the Murray Estuary, Eastern Mount Lofty tributaries, um, and areas such as Wachalunga. Um, and also a, a focus is small bodied fish. So fish that don't grow more than 15 centimetres in maximum length. And the region accounts for almost 80% of the basin's um, small bodied fish. So it's, it's really important and critical habitat for these species. Um, but unfortunately, um, a lot of freshwater fish are declining and particularly the small bodied ones. And there's already been a number of small bodied fish that have been lost um, to the region um, and potentially to the basin and some of them naturally occurred on Wachalunga. Um, so our project is focusing on that. Um, and I'm just going to jump in there and I'm quite a visual person so I'll show you some of these. Uh, I'd love to take you out there and show you in person but I'll just show you like this. Is it going to show me? So this guy here is a little um, southern pygmy perch. So they grow to about nine centimetres and you can see them. They're quite easily identified by their bright red um, fins and tail and black during the breeding season. And unfortunately, there's not many left um, of these guys in the wild. Um, and the other species that um, this guy's a really, really critical one, especially for Wachalunga, is a Yarra Pygmy perch. So they grow to about seven and a half centimetres. Um, so about the size that I'm holding there. Um, and they used to be found in the Wachalunga Reserve. So um, Unfortunately, we haven't found them. Um, they're not, they're probably, well, we're looking at maybe one of the first um, small body native freshwater species to go extinct um, in the Murray Darling Basin. So hopefully we can get these guys back out there and a really, really important species, really important project. And um, yeah, they, um, 
they naturally only found um, occur in the lower lakes and in the coastal areas of Vic and SA. So really important part of the um, area to find these guys. So that's your Yarra Pygmy Perch, which we'll be focusing on. And they weren't real fish, by the way, so no <laughs> fish were harmed. But so our project is focusing on um, traditional monitoring using fike nets, as you can sort of see in the background here, which we've um, been undertaking for the last couple of years throughout Wachalunga. Um, and we're combining that with um, environmental eDNA um, sampling, where essentially you take a water sample um, and it gets analysed and it can tell you um, what species are present in that sample of water. So fish and all sorts of animals in water shed DNA, either by all sorts of mechanisms, we won't go into some of them here, but you can sample that water and you can get an indication of what's there. So we're going to combine that with the traditional netting um, to really attempt to find some of these threatened species that Sylvia talked about. There's another one, Murray Hardyhead, that once occurred through Wachalunga and does still occur through sections of the lower lakes, um, but hasn't been found in recent times in Wachalunga. So we're hoping to increase our ability to detect these species. And this will help to manage Wachalunga and the, the lower Finnis River section um, where Wachalunga occurs. Um, and we might be able to, um, well, we'll be able to point towards reintroduction potentially of species such as Yarra Pugin Perch based on the outcomes of our work. Um, so yeah, thanks again for the funding and the opportunity to work on Wachalunga and we're really looking forward to it. I think you're still muted. Um, yeah. Okay, we're back. Thanks very much for that, uh, Nick and Sylvia. That was um, great use of props. Well done. I think we'll, we'll throw in an extra few dollars for you next time. <laughs> now, thanks very much. And we look forward to seeing the results of that work, obviously, uh, with pretty direct implications for conservation of some uh, endangered native species. So the next, uh, the second of our four presentations um, is from Sarah Baker, and she's talking uh, about the uh, grant that she was awarded, which is a sort of a special one again. It's funded by the Nature Foundation Scientific Expedition Foundation, uh, which is sort of a subset, uh, an RL and GK willing grant of up to $2,000 to support an honors project. So again, very early career. And Sarah's going to talk to us for a few minutes about understanding if habitat manipulation enhances family living in the Gigi skink. Over to you, Sarah. Hello, and thank you so much. I'm an honours student at Flinders University under the supervision of Mike Gardner. And my, my research will be focused on the Gigi skink, a lizard that gives birth to live young, exhibits parental care, and lives in social groups. My study will be looking at the effects of increased habitat availability at the Nature Foundation site, Wichelina, in northern South Australia. Gigi skinks live in rocky crevices found throughout arid Australia, including Wichelina. In 2016, artificial habitat was created alongside natural rocky crevices with the assistance of the Nature Foundation. And these locations throughout Wichelina have been sampled every year since. This sampling has been has been very successful. It has included identification of all lizards found at each site, measurements and genetic samples taken. I will use these data to see if, these in, if the increased habitat availability has helped increase survival of the population of Gigi skinks. So it's advantageous for these lizards to live in groups. Therefore, the makeup of these social groups will be analysed. It is expected that where an excess of habitat is provided, more stable family groups will form. My variables include a study of the relatedness among lizards to see if family groups are staying together. I'll study site fidelity over time to see if individuals stay in the same location or travel. And lastly, repeated paternity will give me an idea of the dispersal and if males are fathering young at different or the same sites. These parameters at the artificial site will be compared with the natural sites. These comparisons will help me understand if the increased habitat availability facilitates these stable aggregations. And the five years of data that I have will provide a true representation of the lizard's movements over time. If the relatedness among lizards is high in the artificial habitat areas, 
If individuals are found in the same location repeatedly and offspring each year are fathered by the same individual, then this will be an indication that increased habitat availability does facilitate family group living. After I visited Wichelina last year, I realised that I not only love the, theater, the theoretical concepts behind the project, but that the fieldwork is so exciting and the site is just incredible. I'm also hoping to make contact with and develop a relationship with the Indigenous community as a way of sharing knowledge and acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the area. So thank you very much Nature Foundation and the Scientific Expedition Group for your ongoing support and funding of this project and I look forward to sharing my results with you all soon. Thank you. Great, thanks very much Sarah. That's a great little presentation and I'm delighted to hear that uh, you like the environment as well. So yeah, we look forward to seeing the results of that and to your further applications as a PhD student. Mike, are you listening? Okay, um, that was really good, thank you. The next uh, of our four presentations, the third one, uh, is uh, from the Roy and Marjorie Edwards Scholarship. Now this is probably the biggest grant uh, we provide. It's through a very generous uh, bequest back in 2003 of several hundred thousand dollars that um, despite low interest rates at the moment, um, we managed to provide a scholarship of $12,000 per annum uh, as operating expenses uh, for up to three years for a PhD or master's student. Uh, and that has uh, gone to uh, Dipna Cullen this year, a uh, very fortunate recipient, uh, but a very, very strong application of direct relevance to uh, Nature Foundation interests in the arid zone as well. Uh, so Dimpna will be talking to us about refuges of the crest-tailed Mulgara in the arid lands. Uh, over to you, Dimpna, your go. So just to let everyone know, um, Dimpna can't be here with us in person tonight because she's actually um, got a window of opportunity to get out into the field, but she has very kindly done a pre-record. So we're just going to share her video. Um, hopefully we can get it working for you. We did test it earlier and it was all good. Hello, uh, my name's Dimpna. I'm from the University of New South Wales and my PhD is investigating the refuges of the Crestel Mulgara. And I'm sure everyone is probably familiar with the idea of the boom and bust cycle in our arid ecosystems, which is characterised by unpredictability of resources. So eruptive population dynamics follow resource pulses after rain, known as the boom phase. And this is followed by a bust phase when populations contract as resources become scarce during the often long periods of low rainfall. These contracted populations endure the harsh conditions in ecological refuges, which can provide protection from predation and support necessary resources for the species. And these refuges are thought to be significant in facilitating the persistence of small mammals during the bust phase, so that refuge populations can provide a resource, a source for eruptive dispersal during the next resource pulse. But despite the theoretical value of refuges, the ecological role of refuges is still quite poorly understood, uh, partly because refuge requirements are likely to be species specific. So particularly for threatened species, an understanding of refuge requirements will help in conservation management. And given that arid zone is experiencing a prolonged drought, it would be expected that small mammals have retracted to refuge habitat. So I'm using this opportunity to investigate the refuge requirements of the Crestel Mulgara. The Crestel Mulgara is a small desi urid. Uh, females weigh about 65 grams and males can weigh up to about 180 grams. And um, partly due to taxonomic confusion until relatively recently, it's quite an understudied species. Uh, their diet consists mainly of invertebrates, but they also eat small mammals and reptiles. And despite their size, they're the largest remaining marsupial predator in the study area. They're a critical weight range mammal, so they have suffered significant range retraction since European settlement. And they're listed as endangered in South Australia and extinct in New South Wales. The aims of my research are to characterise the attributes of refuge habitats for the Crestel Morgara 
to use population genetics to investigate the connectivity of refuge populations and historic dispersal patterns, to identify the fine scale habitat requirements within a known refuge population, and to investigate the behavioural responses to introduced and native predator scent cues. By conducting large scale surveys and manipulative experiments, this uh, research will help to reveal how this arid zone small mammal is able to persist through drought. I'd like to thank the Nature Foundation for their generous support, which will allow this research to happen. And I look forward to bringing you some exciting results uh, very soon. The fourth and final presentation we've got for you today is the Mike Bull Award for Early Career Nature Scientists. So most of you will know Mike Bull as a very productive uh, researcher and not only a great scientist, but a fantastic mentor of students. He started uh, many uh, PhD honours, master's uh, student on their research careers and unfortunately uh, prematurely deceased, uh, but there is a uh, research fund erected in his honour, uh, which the Nature Foundation uh, managers and uh, an independent committee awards this every year uh, to an impressive uh, scientist and uh, I'll just show you the fantastic little medal that the lucky recipient gets with some reptilian critters on there can't quite get the light right but I think you get the general idea uh, and the lucky winner uh, is Eric Nordberg uh, who's going to talk to us about the nocturnal basking behaviour of freshwater turtles in North Queensland. And we will be sending him uh, his medal because obviously we can't fly around as easily as we might have. Uh, so over, over to you, Eric. All right, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I look forward to getting that. That, uh, that medal's amazing. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just start by um, kind of my introduction to, to Mike Bull. So I first learned about him uh, when I was still back in the US. Um, I was watching a BBC documentary called Life in Cold Blood, which probably most of you have seen. And he appeared on screen with David Attenborough talking about the sleepy list. Um, and so instantly, you know, he working with Attenborough, he just gets that legendary status, you know, right off the bat. Um, and it wasn't until um, I moved to, um, to Australia a few years ago to start my PhD and I started attending um, the herpetology conferences, um, which Mike always attended, um, that I met him in person. So I gave my first talk um, at, the, at the conference and I was talking about lizard diets. Um, and after I gave my talk, um, after the session had ended, Mike came up to me and introduced himself. Um, of course, I had already known who he was, but he didn't know who I was. Um, so he was really nice in that um, he's very, you know, uh, inclusive and talks to new students, gets them involved, asks questions about the research and all that, um, which I feel is relatively rare these days. A lot of people of his st uh, status, they don't necessarily need, you know, extra people coming up to chatting to them. They're busy enough. Everybody else is chasing them down, trying to to have a conversation with them, but Mike always was there to, you know, find these these new people, make them feel comfortable and involved. Um, and so that was just such a great, you know, introduction to the society um, and, you know, make new students feel really welcome. Um, so yeah, I'm really honored to be um, a Mike Bull Award recipient. And just to explain a little bit about my research project. Um, so yeah, it's uh, looking at nocturnal basking behavior in fret or turtles. Um, which you might think is a very bizarre type of behavior, um, which is exactly what I thought when I observed it. Um, <clears throat> so up in North Queensland, um, you can see by the background picture, I live near the Ross River. I go canoeing often um, at night looking for wildlife, um, eye shining freshwater crocodiles and things like that. And I continually found freshwater turtles, what I would call nocturnally basking, so sitting on log, things like that, out of the water at night. Um, which seemed pretty bizarre and the more people I talked to it about it, uh, no one has has seen that before. So I started investigating that and um, basically my project is going to try and describe what exactly you're doing. Um, and so my research project will have kind of two components. So the first component will be to kind of describe how spread this behavior is. So is it just this species and just this locality that does it? 
or is more widespread. Um, so to do that, I've just initiated a kind of a global assessment of nocturnal basking. Um, so, so far we've got about 40 different researchers from around the world um, in about 12 different countries on every continent that are going to deploy um, camera traps on basking structures over rivers, take time-lapse photos every two minutes for um, extended periods of time so that we can identify if other species in other regions are also coming to the surface to bask at night or if this is just a, a bizarre situation to have up here in North Queensland. And the second component of the project is going to be trying to disentangle why exactly are they doing this. Um, so it's obvious why animal or turtle bask during the day. So they come out to warm up in the sun, um, but at night there's no sun. So it seems a bit silly to come out and quote unquote bask. Um, so I've designed a couple of other experiments to tease apart a couple of these other mechanisms that might possibly be leading to bizarre behavior including uh, conducting uh, crocodile surveys up and down the river to see if nocturnal basking correlates with increased uh, aquatic predator densities. So going to be looking at um, thermal regulation. So the water is really warm here in the summertime, and so maybe they're getting out of the water just to cool off. And the other things we're looking at are uh, to reduce ectoparasite loads. Um, so turtles live in kind of mucky, muddy water. Um, they get leeches and things like that. Um, so one hypothesis is that they're coming out of the water to drop, um, to make the, the leeches dry out and drop off so that they can reduce their parasite loads. So over the next uh, year or so, we'll be conducting a bunch of these different types of experiments, um, and hopefully we get to distinguish if this is truly a unique thing in just this one species in this one location, or um, if it's a widespread thing that people just don't look at because turtle biologists generally don't go out looking for turtles at night. Um, and hopefully we'll have a better idea of what exactly um, is causing this kind of bizarre behavior. Great. Okay, look, thanks very much for that, Eric. Um, I'm sure that Mike would be very happy to see uh, the medal named in his uh, honour going to uh, such an excellent little project, and, uh, you know, good luck with it. I have to say, though, uh, Nick and uh, Sylvia managed to have little props, you know, they're, they're fish, so why didn't you have any turtles? Maybe, maybe next time. Um, those of you who knew Mike Bull or knew of him, uh, I think would feel encouraged by that to perhaps donate a little bit uh, more to his fund so that we can keep awarding this uh, medal in perpetuity. It's still a growing fund and we'd like to, um, you know, do the best we can by his name and keep that going for as long as uh, possible. So on our website, on the Nature Foundation's website, uh, you can find the facility to make donations to the Mike Bull Fund, uh, should you wish to do so. Uh, on that happy note, uh, I think we're going to open it for questions. So thank you very much to all of the presenters and for those, um, uh, viewers and members who are still with us. I've been monitoring the participant numbers very carefully here. It's like a lecture theatre. We, we haven't lost anybody, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, we'll go to questions and answers, um, and um, you'll monitor those through your uh, chat function, which I'm sure you've all now discovered, and I'll hand back over to uh, Greta to facilitate that. Thank you very much, Greta. Okay, our first question tonight comes from Peter. It's for Nick and Sylvia. And the question is, how well do we understand why these fish species populations have declined so dramatically? Thank you for the question, Peter. Um, and we'll focus on the small body fish, but uh, essentially it's a combination of things. It's loss of habitat. A lot of them are wetland species and they used to be along the southern basin, Murray-Darling Basin, thousands and thousands of wetlands that would support small-bodied fish. Um, a lot of them through river regulation are now dry for extended periods of time or forever. Um, and some are more permanently in inundated. And that's the issue with the lower lakes. Um, they manage the lower lakes to maintain it within about 10 centimetres plus or minus. Um, it's a, an operational um, consideration and these fish have evolved to a dynamic environment where the lower lakes might have varied by over a metre um, naturally. Um, so the fringing habitats that the fish occur in um, around the lower lakes 
don't get that variation, so they don't get the booms in productivity that were um, talked about earlier, um, they don't get um, inundation for spawning and a whole range of things. So um, just as is occurring along the river now and there's a um, Lir lagoon that's being watered by um, Wachalunga, uh, sorry, by Nature Foundation, um, we've got a greater appreciation of that variation and the requirements of small bodied fish. Um, so that's that's part of the decline. Alien species, so around the lower lakes, there's redfin um, that consume small bodied fish. They're obviously, they're only growing to a small size. They, um, Sylvia's gonna hold one up again, only grow to a small size. Um, they're a pretty appetizing meal for a, a large body predatory fish. Um, and I guess most recently and the most obvious um, decline has occurred during the millennium drought. So if you look behind us, the water there, during the millennium drought, the water level was 1.5 meters below sea level. Um, so all of that fringing habitat, all of the habitat behind um, was dry for an extended period of time. And that's where fish that were declining um, sort of reached a critical point. And that's where the Yarrapoon perch was first lost um, to the region, um, as Sylvia mentioned, and signaling the first freshwater fish extinction from the basin. Um, and so for fish like that that are gone, the only way to bring them back is, is to restore the habitat and manage the habitat better, but also reintroductions. And we've um, been involved in reintroductions that have got them back for an months or up to a couple of years and then they've declined again. Um, so it's it's that combination of reinstating the fish but also managing um, the habitat in such a way that supports them. Um, and, and so that's the work that we're doing will help provide information on how to manage the system. And then the next logical step is to conduct the reintroductions um, in conjunction with um, effective management in the future. So we do reintroduction projects all over the place. And that is a question that people ask that why are they declined? And if you're going to reintroduce a species, how are they going to survive again? But it is that understanding their requirements of the different species and also um, putting them back at an appropriate time. Thanks very much, Nick. Oh. Um, our next question is for Eric. Um, do you have any River Murray sites as part of your research? Uh, thanks for that. Um, off the top of my head, I do not think we do. Uh, and so I'd encourage anybody that wants to get involved, um, if you want to put camera traps and look for turtles basking in and around any regions that you're at, uh, please feel free to contact me and you can be involved in this as well. So one of the things I'm also interested in doing as a part of this global assessment is I'll get a more detailed understanding about how this is in Australia as well. Um, and so, yeah, I'm um, happy to include many other sites and people that um, can contribute data as well. Uh, so hopefully my uh, email will be available to anybody that's interested. Um, and yeah, please feel free to contact me. That's awesome, thanks Eric. We can certainly share that email with um, people who are interested. Um, and another question for Sarah. Um, do you know how many Gigi skinks live in a family group, Sarah? Uh, Gigi skinks have, they produce young, they produce four to five young maybe less than that and so in my project i'm going to be looking at whether those those babies will stick around as they grow up and stay in that family group or if they'll be heading off on their own so i'll find that out <laughs> we'll wait for the next exciting chapter yeah <laughs> thank you thanks sarah uh any any last burning questions before we move on to the nature foundation update and the second part of our um feature webinar tonight No, looks like we're all good. Uh, if you think of anything after the webinar, feel free to email us and we'll follow it up and get back to you as well if anything um, comes through later on. In that case, I'll hand over um, back to our chair, Jan Ferguson. Thanks, Greta. And how fantastic was that? As a person who comes out of a, a science background, research and development, I'm always uh, fascinated to hear new and groundbreaking science and fantastic that that can inform our work on our nature reserves and other people's you know, land holdings as well. Back to an update about the, the foundation, which is um, the other part of uh, uh, tonight and look, just like to say, we're all missing seeing you. You know, we actually have 
Um, we've done pretty well with the technology. We've kept most things going, but COVID means we actually miss seeing you because the, the foundation is a lot about its people. And at the moment we're, we're seeing isolated random uh, ones every now and again, but we're not seeing you as a collective group. We had to cancel our working bees and the very, anything that um, creates a crowd. And so we, we're missing that, but we'll be, we'll be back with strength once um, science gets COVID under control. <laughs> It, it may force us to hold our AGM virtually uh, because we, we're watching the situation in Victoria, as is everybody, and it may mean that we have to have a blend of people and virtual, or we may um, go uh, completely to virtual to enable you to all stay safe in your own environment. We've really approached um, COVID very carefully because we have we do engage with people, we have people on our reserves, and we just want to make sure that we can keep you all safe when you are anywhere associated with the Foundation. We've been, the fact that we haven't been doing events and getting together with people has given us time to really implement the company structure that you all voted for uh, last year, and we've been working away, getting everything in place, converting the Foundation from an incorporated association to a company. We've moved to Prospect, which is where I am tonight. The, um, the staff and myself are here to bring this uh, webinar to you. It, it's a lovely surroundings. Um, it's very appealing to, um, to all of us and assists us greatly in our work. Um, we're in a, we had terrible trouble at Holden Street with our technology and we've now got much faster internet. Might sound like a small thing, but makes the world a difference. We've actually advertised for new directors and we had an absolutely amazing response. We had 49 people apply to be directors on the board of the foundation, which I certainly did not expect. Uh, we interviewed uh, seven people and we've made, uh, the, the board decided based on the very high caliber of applicants that we had to appoint to um, directors to the casual vacant vacancies, Anne-Marie Barbaro and Beck Hardy, who will be known to, to some of you. I'd like at this point to thank two of the directors who retired uh, during the year, um, Susie Hertzberg and Suzanne Ridding. They both had unique qualities and unique experience and brought something really dynamic to the foundation and, and will be missed. The, the highlights of what's going on in the background uh, while we're you know, all staying safe with, from COVID, we've been doing a lot of work on SCB offsets, which protects um, a lot more um, like species fauna, flora fauna, but particularly it's, a, it's an, an amount of um, hectares that will be protected uh, in, for conservation in, in perpetuity. We're working with SA Water, I'm just gonna name a few of these, SA Water, Oz Mineral, Santos, and we're working on new and exciting um, opportunities that sometimes we're working on other people's land, sometimes we're working on our own land, but basically our motivation is to maintain land for conservation. You've seen the exciting work of some of our students tonight, and um, that, that's always a highlight of the year. We've got some, you know, we've got some big um, infrastructure holdings. Um, we're putting in a new kitchen at uh, Wichelina, which some of us think is pretty exciting because old one's a bit tired. Um, we've we upgraded the power, which is a you know a, a very significant necessity. You, you've got to have electricity to run things. Um, we will replace. Um, we've got a series of pretty old banged up cars um, in the foundation because we've never got a lot of money. Um, but this year we will replace uh, our cars, which will be a highlight to our rotational managers who drive our current um, you know banged up cars. Um, I mean they're safe enough, but they're they're a bit tired. Um, it, it's fair to say we have taken a hit like others have with our investments due to the COVID and the crashing of uh, stock markets and the, and the like, um, but we're hopeful over time um, that we'll recover. I'd like, just like I thank the directors of the board, I'd like to also thank um, our volunteers. We have a lot of volunteers in the organisation, uh, particularly the rotational managers who manage the reserves and do a lot of um, conservation work and um, maintaining our um, our holdings. Um, we also have a lot of volunteers in the office and so we have people with who are quite highly skilled who for one reason or other have time to volunteer and they put a lot of time into the office and that actually assists us. We couldn't do what we do without the volunteers. So I'm now going to hand over to um, Hugo who's going to give you a bit more detail on uh, some of the things that we've been up to while well, we've not been so visible.
Good evening, everybody, and, and thank you, Jan. Um, I reckon that Greta and Amy are going to put up a bit of a PowerPoint thing, and I'll speak to that as we go. So uh, what I'd like to do is just run through um, a few of the activities of Nature Foundation over the year 2019-20. And next slide, thanks. And uh, it's probably all of you can just think about how things were before the before Christmas, and uh, it seemed to be a real societal attitude swing for both for nature uh, against species extinction and also wanting climate action. And next slide. But then we had the summer of bushfires, and this this photo is actually taken on Kangaroo Island. You can see the glow one fire on, over the ridge, another one actually crowning out at night, which means it's really hot and dry. But uh, it really changed things right around the country. The fire started in Queensland in September, and then they arrived in South Australia, really with gusto just prior to Christmas in at Cudley Creek and Kangaroo Island, South East Air Peninsula. And then just when we thought that would uh, be embedded in our memories for a long time, um, coronavirus arrived and, and really the world has changed. And, um, for us here, we're in um, the new office that Jan just mentioned for about 21 days and then the whole team, staff team and volunteers moved to working from home. And as mentioned, we had to close our nature reserves to visitors um, to keep our people safe and our visitors safe. We cancelled every event uh, other than virtual events like this, but it really drove us to look at uh, how to innovate and take um, the closure as an opportunity and also to embrace new technology. And so how do you stay on track uh, when so many things are so changeable like that? Society, fires, COVID and other things. Well, we actually have a strategic plan that we work to. So what I thought we would do is just quickly run through that in a series of, of snapshots for the last financial year. And the first one, the, the goal one is increasing the area protected. And the photo on screen is actually Wichelina, which is about the same size as Kangaroo Island. And through a partnership with Oz Minerals, that yellow area is the SEB offset. And that, because of that, uh, that partnership, we're now able to monitor and manage that um, really intensively. And uh, also we have um, standards we have to meet with the South Australian government regulator. We also received a gift of land in the southeast from a, a living bequester, which is just awesome. It's a beautiful piece of native vegetation adjacent to Gigiela Conservation Park. The Water for Nature program, continued and I'll just touch on that a bit later and also the wildlife recovery fund grants uh, are also playing their part in protecting uh, areas impacted by bushfires. And nature science, well you've just seen that in, in the very best way possible with uh, the awards that, that Phil has uh, mentioned tonight and also the talks. Um, and closer to home, um, on which later in Hiltabu we've been doing bird surveys and, and tracking populations and diversity and, and numbers. And when it rained, finally rained at Wichelina, and you'll see the graph in a GIF, um, Alex Nankerville, our uh, conservation programs manager and a colleague, shot up there and as you can see, um, studied insects. And the, that boom bust uh, landscape is just characterised by incredible insect activity within a few days of that rainfall. And while talking about um, that sort of thing. Um, we're also um, through Alex and in partnership with um, the unis here studying the ecosystem dependencies that, that go right from termites and their role in the ecosystem through to the, the apex predator there, the raptors. And on Hildeba, um, it's the westernmost occurrence of the yellow-footed rock wallaby, um, but we don't know enough about them. So this year we've put some tracking devices on some of them and we can see where they wander through the day and at night. And once again, um, the nature science, the wildlife recovery funds have uh, are going to advance some knowledge gaps in the impact of those fires and recovery and resilience for future fires and the water for nature monitoring. You've already seen some of that in brief tonight. And then nature better understood. Um, the top photo is uh, in the centre there is about the private land conservation conference at the Wine Centre. So it's, it's run by the Australian Land Conservation Alliance of which Nature Foundation is a founding member and I'm a director, um, but it was the biggest conference in the series over five or six years and, uh, and the feedback was just awesome. The, the people were so happy with what they heard and who they met there. 
And so the partnerships are all important here. And, uh, and that's why we are part of that, what's called ALCA, but also locally here in South Australia, the South Australian Nature Alliance. And we are a, an active member in the South Australian Chamber of Mines and Energy, which seems a bit strange, but um, it's, a, it's a very good place to form unlikely alliances and see some really awesome things happen in nature conservation. And then we've been um, just busy and methodical and even handed on submissions on things like the EPBC Act, um, the Bushfires Royal Commission and the Pastoral Act Review as well. Just trying to change for the better the, the world in which we work. And then for goal four, um, it's about engaged communities. And the prime one there is, is kids on country, but we, can't, we couldn't hold any on country camps. And this is one of those innovations where uh, the team decided that they would convert that whole um, experience online and keep the classrooms and the teachers and the schools and their families and communities engaged. So we're just about to launch into that uh, with great excitement. And then um, on social media, um, Greta tells me that um, prior to the bushfires, we had about 7,000 Facebook shares and that peaked out at 185,000 within a couple of weeks. And it really just shows that the whole world community was watching and actually wanting to help. And I uh, have to say, engaging communities online, it's great to see your faces, but it's just so nice when we can be together, as, as Jan was saying earlier, and that thing, innovation, yet again. And the final one is an inspirational organisation, and we've touched on those top two, uh, or three really, but the thing that has really stood out for us is um, how adaptable and um, supportive people have been all the way through the coronavirus shutdown. It's worried all of us and people right around the world. And the, the share markets have uh, really moved around a fair bit, but usually down. But we can't get over the incredible generosity from here and right around the world uh, for the Bushfire, uh, the Wildlife Recovery Fund, um, and also to, for donations to our own appeals. And uh, we, we have finished the year with a very strong balance sheet, but we've got all our financials to do and the auditors are about to get active here at Nature Foundation, which will thrill Georgie Feeder, our finance and corporate manager. And then I just want to give you a few stats here. So um, the Wildlife Recovery Fund, which was an initiative of Minister Spears and uh, a partnership with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. But you can see on screen what's been raised there. And to date, that's just exceeded uh, $700,000, which is just incredible. Um, and they range from a few dollars from uh, individuals to some um, very large donations from some organisations and individuals and even about $796 from a lemonade stand in Brisbane. So uh, it, it's just uh, people of all ages uh, supporting and 1,100 donors worldwide. And that's enabled us to um, release grants, which uh, uh, you'll see in the next slide. Uh, to 20, we had 68 applications seeking 1.8 million and we're able to fund 20 of those. And it's a whole range of things through on-ground uh, activities through to research, um, such as looking at what happens to fungi after a really hot fire goes through and, and fungi, uh, once again, are those ingredients to uh, really connected and biodiverse ecosystems. And we'll skip on here quite quickly just to see what's happening. Uh, some of our nature reserves, and I, I think really it's char characterized by that image and by that word. And the next slide show just how it is. Um, and we're just updating our data. So you'll see that they're uh, about 12 months uh, to go behind where we are. But see how the rainfall has dipped and it has stayed down. So this is at Wichelina. And um, we had one rainfall event of about 20 something mils about 18 months ago, another one of about 30 mils in February and a couple of uh, low mils rainfalls and that's it. And so it, it is incredibly dry uh, up in that landscape in the centre. And Jan will tell you that about Bill Tanner Town as well. Next slide. And so what happens to the wildlife? So you can see the red kangaroo density there and it's heading down. And when uh, Alex was up, Macaville was up there about a week and a bit ago, uh, he measured it at around one per square kilometre. So you can see it's gone from as high up around eight and it's down really low. And there's very little, if any, water in the landscape. Next slide. And so too with the birds. So they're either um, based off uh, generally seeds or insects. And so when the rain is so low, you can see the bird numbers dropping right away. And, and this is the thing that really worries us if species can't have a sustainable number there to breed up again. 
when the rains come. And we're also um, battling grazing pressure. So you can see the, the pet silo, that shot of the camels is actually at Hiltaba, which is quite unusual to have them so far south, but it shows how dry it is north. Um, goats, talking to Chris Reed today, um, and he said there's about 150 goats back on Hildeba, and we only had a shoot at, um, about two weeks ago. So they, they move around a lot. Uh, fortunately for all, uh, rabbits are in low numbers, but need to be ever vigilant. And then the next slide which shows the, the other thing that we struggle with, which is vagrant stock coming through our boundary fences. And so in the, in the year that's gone, we've really looked at uh, investing quite a, quite a sum of capital to get that right. And you can fix it this better. And so first of all, we're building exclosures at Hildeburg to look at uh, access for different sized animals and grazers and see what that leaves us in the landscape uh, compared to um, uh, uncontrolled. And then this is Greg Bannon, one of our rotational managers surveying the view, which is red dust and sand hills. And this is um, what the fence was like between Wichelina and Beltana, and that was a good bit. Um, this is what we did in partnership with the Beltana people. And this is the result. Um, we end up with quite a strong fence. It's not all uh, cyclone, a lot of it's five wire. And then the other actions are um, taking advantage of the rains when they do come to try and keep on wearing down buffalo grass infestations on Wichelina. And we're keen, keen to round that up to a very low level. It's about 1,000 hectares out of that 421,000. And we had contractors in to take advantage of that. And there's also the rotational managers and, and their friends and a very wide circle of volunteers been working away on uh, the build assets, which provide great accommodation, as some of the researchers would know, um, for our work on, on both nature reserves. And the top right is the bookkeeper's cottage, and um, that's about just about ready to move into after an awesome effort. And the other images off to the left are the Hildeburg wool shed, which is about to have um, received the treatment to bring it back into a uh, usable condition. And finally, I uh, just want to run quickly through uh, the effect of water in the landscape. And I thought that would uh, sustain us all for another 12 months or so. And we can motor through these pretty fast, Greta. Um, so this is the Water for Nature program. And that's the, the stats for the year that's just gone. But we've heard about endangered species in, in the River Murray corridor. And the watering sites have actually seen Murray Hardyhead numbers go through the roof, which is extraordinary, um, with careful management of water of the salinity. And then um, examples of southern bell frog and latham snipe, which are both really rare in the, in the southern or in South Australia now. And once again, um, partnerships all the way through with communities, traditional owners, irrigators, um, three levels of government. It's, it's just a great combo effort there. And that'll just warm your heart, that's the Cadell. And there's the southern bell frog. And the hardy head work in conjunction with Natural Resources, SMB, now Landscape Board. And so the year ahead, um, we just, we're really excited about uh, the energy and the momentum that we have here at the moment. Um, the, this ever stronger science base, um, going online and using the technology and also uh, getting more wetlands watered. And we're really looking forward to working with the Heritage Agreement community uh, as part of a, a five partner group, which is delivering a brand new government initiative, which will be, you'll hear a bit more about later. Um, and finally, um, we couldn't do this, next slide, do this without the support of um, our community. And, uh, and we get that help in so many different ways. But the key thing, the, most, the major thing that all of us can do is actually tell a story. So thank you, Jan. Thank you. Greta um, will now um, take us through the questions. If, should, there, should there have been any of either my presentation or of Hugo's? So, so far we haven't received any questions come through, but we've still got a bit of time. If you'd like to um, pop them in the Q&A, if anyone's got a question, we, we can certainly answer it. Or I should say Jan and Hugo can answer it. <laughs> oh, you hope we can. Or Phil. <laughs> <laughs> 
I feel there's one answer questions he just said. <laughs> oh, okay, so it counts him out. <laughs> okay, so we've got one from Peter. He's um, wondering what activities are being taken at Watchalunga to rehabilitate the vegetation? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, once again, trying to pick the seasons. Um, there's been a really good uh, reveg effort there, carefully designed with species and layout in conjunction with Gould to Burlington Local Planning Association, and they, they were fantastic job out there. And, um, really looking at the, um, the wetland part with the encroachment of reeds and whether we need to modify some of the, uh, that sort of habitat, but also looking at habitat such as lignin planting for the little birds, the Mount Lofty Ranges, Southern Emu Wren, and then in the water, um, who knows what, what Nick and Sylvie might recommend to us in the future. Thanks, Hugo. Anything else anyone would like to know? I feel like saying forever hold your peace, but that's not quite appropriate, is it? Because we'll ask <laughs> questions at any time. <laughs> no? Looks like all the presentations have been so comprehensive. Jan, I think you can happily close the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we acknowledge this technology is, you know, not always how we'd like to do it, but at least with this technology, we can still stay, stay in touch and keep you informed about everything that the Foundation is doing. Um, this uh, webinar will be recorded, uh, so feel free to direct your family and friends to it. And I'd just like to, in closing, tell you a story. So before this, I thought, well, I better have a bite to eat and, you know, before I come to the Foundation, because I, I don't do... I don't do hungry well. Um, and so I'm sitting there and the person behind me is talking about how she went to this website today and she found this place called Witchelina and she thought it'd be a really fantastic place mm -hmm. to go and she thought her friend should go with her. So I thought that was a good, a good thing to close on. You know, here, here you are, you're somewhere in a random cafe with random people sitting behind you and they're talking about the foundation. So please spread the word, spread the word about the, uh, the webinar, get more people interested. We really have a fantastic organisation doing fantastic things um, for conservation and we need to, we can grow that with more and more people who are prepared to uh, contribute. We look forward to seeing you all soon in one form or another and, and thanks so much for your participation tonight. Thanks everyone, have a great night.